The following podcast contains adult language and themes. Doctor's orders. Listener discretion is advised. Death, a universal phenomenon, comes with an array of emotions and experiences, none more profound than grief. When we lose someone close, grief can wash over us like a relentless tide, engulfing our hearts and minds with a mixture of sorrow, disbelief, and longing. It carries with it a process that has no shortcuts, no predetermined timelines. Instead, it demands that we navigate this labyrinth of emotions at our own pace, honoring the memories of those we've lost, in the hope that gradually we'll find healing, acceptance, and even joy amidst the pain. In the face of death and loss, grief becomes a testament to the enormity of our love and the preciousness of life. I'm dead serious. You guys are going to want to stick around to hear what these panelists have to say about this topic. I'm your host, Matt, and this is the Going There Podcast. And if I was drinking alone, it's because I was thinking of you, drinking alone, after one of our fights, and sleep doesn't come to the righteously stubborn, no sleep doesn't come. Most people think neither of death nor nothingness. Rather, they face the reality that they are going there. Taboo topics are back on the table. Death, passing away, kicking the bucket, buying the farm, milking the joke. We have a million different ways to describe death, kind of like uh, the Inuit and and, uh, snow. You know, they have all these different words for it. Yet it seems like it's something that we have zero grasp on as a society. It is a part of the life cycle that we ignore until we absolutely have to face it. And so even though it's a guaranteed experience, we, we usually aren't prepared for it. Um, and even when we know we've been through it, sometimes we forget that muscle memory that would have normally been there otherwise. And so today we're gonna get deep into one of the hardest conversations, but something that is universal. I would say above all else, the topics we've covered, death is one of the two things other than taxes we all have in common, right? So let's introduce our panel, starting with my co-producer to my left. Hi, my name is Portia Brenner. Um, In addition to being one of the co-producers, I am also an actor, writer, and casting director. Um, And as always, glad to be here for this conversation. And you specifically are in this episode, and this episode was actually uh, your brainchild because you recently experienced something that is on topic. Yeah. um, My best friend uh, recently passed away after a very long illness, um, and I'm still kind of coping with that. That was in April, so it's Still very fresh and very raw. And and she was how old? 36. 36. It's tough. Yeah. Um, also returning is to my right, my favorite aunt, Aunt Rach. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, to, to call it brave, and I'm not just using cheesy, easy words. I appreciate you being here more than I can possibly put into words. Thank you. Um, my name is Rachel Adela. I am a preschool teacher in West Akron. I am a return guest. I am so happy to be invited back, especially for this one, because I really, I have a lot of thoughts, but I think it's really important for people to talk about. Um, And a big reason is because I am a recent widow. When I found out about that, I was just like shocked. And I still wanted to make sure like you knew you got a family here at the Going There podcast. I Free noticed. promotion. Uh, we no. were like plastering all over the uh, obituaries. No. No, I noticed. I noticed the people who checked on me. It's it's good. 
Thank you. Well, we love you and we're so happy to have you back. Also returning is like my guru mentor, uh, Mr. Shannon Blower. Hi, Matt. Hello, folks. I'm uh, Shannon. I'm the director of pastoral care. I find myself in that position, but at my heart of hearts, I'm a palliative chaplain. Uh, I work with families that are going through both the process of grieving a loved one and the loved one themselves uh, experiencing a terminal diagnosis. And th those things are uh, deep, deep waters and tragically beautiful. So I'm happy to be here as well, Matt. And those of you who watch our show or, or listen weekly, uh, you probably remember him from season one where we talked about death. And this one is not just a rehashing of that. We're going into new territory. And also on season two, one of the most powerful and impactful episodes, in my opinion, was the first one we did on church trauma. And uh, that one will always have a special place in my heart. And, and part of that was because Shannon was there sharing his thoughts. And where I default to humor, Shannon often goes deep and, and can talk from an emotional standpoint. So happy to have you back and even happier that he brought us a new face and voice and somebody who is going to have a lot of awesome, important information on this topic. Somebody who makes me embarrassed for being the same age as me and being far more successful. Please introduce yourself, new panelists. Hi, I'm Lou Hashiguchi. I'm actually a uh, hospice and palliative care physician here in Akron. Um, my role is honestly to help with patients with progressive or terminal illnesses from a quality of life standpoint, whether that's just symptoms or kind of dealing with how do I live my life as somebody who is this sick? Uh, and and I like to tell my patients and their families that my patients are not just my patients. My patients are also their families. So helping them guide um, guide them through the course of whatever illness might be in front of them. Um, but really, from that standpoint, I'm kind of a gateway to Shannon because that is his specialty. Uh, I'm, I just dabble. You're, you're that gateway drug we've been hearing yeah, about that's me. in schools for so long till you get the hard stuff like this guy. <laughs> Um, well, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I feel like I obviously have my own experiences and opinions on things, but I will say that I'm largely going to defer to the panel for a lot of things. Uh, I'll be here as a moderator, and if you need a shoulder for a minute, I'm happy to be here for that and offering. But uh, we're still going to have fun. We're still going to make some jokes, and we're still going to go there. So I'm excited about this. I uh, fully expect to cry and or swear. I hope everybody's yeah. okay with it. I thought you were going to say cry, fart, snort, laugh, like all Farts, of Farts, I'm a lady. Oh, yeah. sorry. I forgot. I forgot. Okay, the nerd in me has to use this quote that uh, Portia reminded me about. Those of you who saw WandaVision, I think they stole this quote from somewhere else, but he says, what is grief if not love persevering? I mean, everybody kept quoting that. You saw memes for it because it was beautiful. And it's it, that is the essence of what I want to touch on in this episode. So this, we're talking about life after death. We're really talking about grieving. I mean, some of it's about our personal journey, but also I think a lot of what we're going to talk about is when it's very unexpected. You know, when your 95-year-old grandmother passes away, it's sad, but you see it coming down the road for a long time. When somebody young or somebody who was, you know, otherwise perfectly healthy or somebody who's part of your everyday life who that was not even in your mind, it's very different. Um, and Shannon's experienced that personally, and you've talked about that a little bit, and I think we all have. And it's it's not fun. And the fact that you two are willing to talk about it from a personal um, experience is is heartwarming and wonderful. And the fact that you guys can offer some viewpoints that are even more educated and professionally experiential that nobody else would be able to touch on is fantastic. So let's get into it. End of life decisions. How do we talk about it? Creating a will, losing people early. How do we deal with it? And how should others around us deal with it, right? So why is planning for the inevitable so difficult? And this is open to anyone at any point. It is a free-for-all. Welcome to the party. <laughs> so I have an experience around this. So I've been doing palliative care uh, not as long as Dr. Luke, but I have been doing it, right? And I remember just being like, oh, God, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's get this done. Let's get our, uh, our, our, our wishes expressly put down. And so I have four sons and four daughter-in-laws and a lot of grandkids, 13 grandbabies, and we were all together. And I said, hey, listen, let's do this thing. And it, it's, um, 
uh, you know, this little questionnaire. I said, let's do this together so we can get this settled, right? So we know what one another wants. I, it's, it's just important. And I was so excited about it. And each one of my kids was like, why in the world are you ruining tonight? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> like what the hell is this? Man, you are a bummer. So it is, it, it is both taboo uh, from a cultural standpoint, but I think it is also, it, it, there's this super uh, kind of superstition that if we yeah. if we talk about it, we're going to make it happen. We're going to manifest it, which is, you know, not accurate. <laughs> Wait, that's not science? <laughs> but here's the thing, though, like, uh, and this is truthfully what I believe makes it hard is to start planning for it, you have to accept that dying is a possibility. Ah, you have to accept that that is a reality and an inevitable reality. Um, and that's hard for human beings to do. We are innately driven towards life, driven towards survival. That is our uh, immediate reaction for everything. Um, so to, to even begin that discussion, you have to go, gosh, I'm, I'm finite, you know, I am mortal, uh, which we're not used to doing. Yeah. It is the most common experience that is the least spoken about. <laughs> Like it is the common denominator and we just don't talk about it because of the items that you addressed. We are mortal. There is an existential, it doesn't have anything to do with religion. It, it can, but there is an existential angst that says, I don't know how I got here and I don't know what's going to happen when this ends. You've made a point, I think, probably on the show, but also in one-on-one -on -one conversations where we talk about this idea of as humans, we strive for a life without suffering, without adversity. And by the way, that's a boring ass life, but we we lean into it so hard that, you know, and you and I are the same age. We grew up in the same area. I used to jump off of buildings and do all kinds of crazy stuff. I thought I was invincible. Why would I think about that inevitable doom, right? And it is, it's something that I personally feel like if we live in that essence, knowing that it's finite, I feel like that makes life in some ways more beautiful. But I don't know if it's cultural. I don't know if it's if it's just the human condition. I don't. I don't know. Well, I think what you're passing on from what you're telling me, he said, is interesting because I don't know if I agree with that. Right? Um, striving for a comfortable life is what we strive for, but the process therein is hard. It is hard work. It is suffering. Um, I, I saw a clip recently of some Indian teacher that said, when we teach our young, when we, uh, um, our mentors, we say, you must work hard, but why not work joyfully? Why not work gracefully? And that attitude, I think, is really what, what drives us. We have to work hard. We have to suffer because it makes it noble. It makes it meaningful. Without pain, without suffering, there is no meaning. So to strive for a comfortable life I feel is kind of the magical end point, right? That's that's the thing, the smoke that we grasp that goes through our fingers. But the process and the journey in our minds has to be hard. Uh, so, I, so I mean, I that. agree. I, I think it takes an enlightened person to approach it that way. Yeah. But I do think when you look at our world of convenience and instant gratification and work styles and different things, I do think that we we avoid some of the pain and suffering, which of course, yeah, right. You don't want everything to be horrible. But as somebody who can say with a therapist who about smacks my head with with her fist over the frustration of Matt, can you be, be present for five minutes and enjoy the journey? I Even somebody who gets it still has a hard time doing it. Can you go back to the quote that you opened with? I'm sorry. I I, I didn't watch. I'm like the only person that didn't watch WandaVision. Oh, wait. So, <laughs> oh, well, that that's break, not going over well. Break for a little, wow. you know, cinematic instruction here. We're going to have to edit but that out. Go back to that quote. <laughs> so, you know about the. You I and I have seen a Marvel movie together. So, uh, yes. Vision and Wanda. No, I, yes, I'm familiar. Just go Vision to says to her in a flashback scene, what is grief? if not love persevering. And I hope I'm not butchering that quote. Okay. Because he's dead at that point. Yeah. I am learning so much. He is dead. God. Spoilers. <laughs> he is gone. And, if you haven't she, seen uh, Infinity War by now, that's on you. Yeah. It's yeah. been like yeah. five, so six years. So she manifested him and so he says, uh, what is grief if not love persisting, I think, or everlasting, one of the two. Yeah. There are several variations on that. One that I love is grief is the price that we pay for love. Mm. One is um, grief is love with nowhere to go. 
And I love that one um, because it's like I've got all this, but nowhere to put it. Um, But when you talk about, you know, yes, we seek a comfortable life. And I I like one of the things that Tom and I always said to each other, and you're going to hear the name Tom a lot tonight because it is important to me that I say my late husband's name. Um, But he and I always talked about how we both believed that um, the purpose of love and the purpose of human life together and relationships at all is that joys are multiplied and grief is divided. And I feel like that is kind of, that kind of goes along with what you were saying about seeking comfort and living joyfully. And yes, we're going to go through hard things, but why not have somebody to share it with? I don't, I don't know if that fits with it though. Maybe, but I think it's interesting that you use the quote of grief is love with nowhere to go. Because I think that that belief is truthfully what makes grief hard. Do you still love Tom? Absolutely. So that love still has somewhere to go. Are you still grieving? Yep. So I, grief, grief is love. Grief is love with somewhere to go. But again, without that physical manifestation present. That's true. That's true. So it is, it's the loss of that, I think, is what you're feeling. I think you're right. Is it that love is a uh, electrical circuit <laughs> and it can't just stay within one thing, but it needs connection? For, for both of you, really, what, what types of things trigger that grief? I'm still learning. Um, Can you, I'm sorry, no, if, you're, if you're comfortable saying this, Please. I think it's important to show how amazing it is that you're here, how recent uh, Tom passed away. Um, tomorrow will be 12 weeks um, to the day since he passed. So it's still very raw. Um, that's that's a blink and, of an eye. Yeah. And to be quite honest, I'm still learning the triggers. Um, for about the first month or so, I was kind of functioning on adrenaline and autopilot and got to get up, got to get through the next thing. Um, and uh, Honestly, I don't, I do not remember the first month, the first six weeks. I don't remember it. Um, Would you guys say from a clinical standpoint that it's probably still shock or? You know, it could be a trauma response, all those things. It is um, one way to understand uh, uh, the uh, the experience is that your predictable arc of life, all of us have this predictable arc. We, we I drove here thinking I was going to get here. Um, uh, I got on this podcast thinking we're going to talk on it. When the predictable arc of yours and Tom's relationship is disrupted, that causes a tailspin of how do I make sense of this? And so the trauma of that is so significant. Our, our, our responses to it are both, uh, sort of automatic. Our subconscious sort of takes over and we do a thing that, you know, uh, it may be healthy, I guess, but it's, it, it's, has a cost, which is splitting. We sort of split and we say, I can't think about this because I have to do, well, I have to be at, back at work in five days. I can't <laughs> think about this because I have to, this, You're this, functioning this. human. It's a survival technique. Right. And, and I have to recharge my battery enough to get to a place where I can yeah. do X, Y, Z. That's exactly right. And so um, there's so many layers of the, uh, the suddenness of the experience. Um, the least of which is uh, its break in your continuum of expectation and storyline and meaning. Sure. And so the the art is, truthfully, Rachel, the art is whatever the hell you want it to be, <laughs> right? Uh, you get to decide how you stitch things back together. Right. Um, but, in the, but in the end, it is that you are able to stitch something back together so that somehow, somehow, now your new experience allows for uh, disruption as well as continuity. That's beautiful. And I will say- That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for being so candid with your answer because uh, that is, in my opinion, the honest to God truth because in my communication with you, Mm -hmm. we talked about stuff and there was no trigger. There was no emotions because you had been like, (laughs) <laughs> nope, I need to just kind of get through my day. And that is like, as anyone who experiences grief totally can understand that. Sure. Portia, what about you? What about triggers? Is there a causation or effect with uh, 
trauma response? For me, this death, this loss was so different because I viewed it from different angles. She'd been sick for 17 months, so we we knew that that day was coming. But when it was time to sit next to her bed, as she transitioned, I was there with her parents. She's a mother of four children. Um, she had recently become a grandmother. Um, so for me, it triggers me seeing my own kids, you know, and I think of it as a parent, you know, and then I think as a mom, like if I left my kids. So my my daughter, you know, coming home from college, you know, was, was hard because she'll never get that experience. So just for me, everyday things, she was in my wedding. So photos all over my house of her. Um, music on the radio. We were so close and we spent so much time together that like just everything. And I'm, I'm at a place right now where I see her all the time. I see her a lot of the places I go. Um, and the last four years of her being here, um, we had a very strained relationship and didn't speak. It wasn't until she got sick that we reconnected. And um, I think a lot of that is guilt piled on top of grief. And I think me seeing her, you know, and, and I don't mean like in a, I don't see her, but, you know, I'll see someone with a long blonde ponytail or, you know. We have the guys in white ponytail. coats over there waiting <laughs> on call just yes. in case. I feel guilty because I should have had like a train going a loop with this Kleenex on the table because I feel like I'm sorry that I did not supply more Kleenex. Um, I feel blessed because not only are you guys willing to talk about this on the podcast, I was so close to my heart and something I'm passionate about, but I am in your lives enough to have been around you and for you to share with me even offline, uh, somebody you trust to be comfortable with that grief. Um, and, and just to echo Portia's story, I talked to her the day before, are we saying her name? You can. The day before Portia's friend Molly passed away, I talked to her and she said, I'm ready, I'm prepared. And then the day it happened, she couldn't have been less prepared from an emotional standpoint. And that's not by any means a um, criticism of her. It's to show how grieving and loss, even when we think I've got this, I've lost people, you know, I got this. And then it hits you and you're like, holy shit, I do not have this. And I prepared myself for that phone call so much and thought through the different scenarios and it was not. Portia's brain works like mine where you work that flow chart with like 40, if, if this happens and this happens and this, you know, like a conspiracy theorist nut job. <laughs> Only because she told me this. I'm not ripping on Portia. It's like you bring these people on, then you harass them and make them share intimate details. And she was like, Matt, I've thought of every single way this can go. And then the next phone call was Matt. I thought about every single way this can go and... It still went nothing like I could have ever imagined. And the way that my body and emotion, her body, she she couldn't move. She could barely talk. She couldn't eat. I was physically sick. Physically sick. Both of you have dealt with so much emotional trauma throughout your life. It's not like you were sheltered people. And you knew this was coming to some extent. And yet, it still has this power over us that we cannot put our hands on and and, and make tangible and put into words and it's um it's it's just life altering and then you're in limbo and and like shannon was saying where do i go from here how do i do this what is the new normal so i want to riff back to um the insight that dr luke brought to the table which is this um most of us never want to even though it's going to happen we never want to be in that space so you have to ask, what is the twistedness of uh, Dr. Luke? Like, what is going on with him that he would choose this as a profession? Like, what is wrong with me that I would choose something like this as a pre profession? And it, and it is not so much that there's something maladaptive. It is more like somehow uh, Dr. Luke, uh, to some degree myself, has found the magic in living uh, very close kin to joy and sorrow in that same container, um, he will, he recognizes that those who do this work recognize, oh goodness, this is uh, horribly beautiful. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's putting things together that don't belong, right? They, they seemingly do not belong. And so the, the role that, that you played, uh, the, the, I, I got this now, I got this. 
many of us are not prepared how to step into that space because it is so unpredictable. We've not done the pre-work of staying current in our relationships uh, is something that needs to be at, in the mix. So let me ask you two, how much of that is cultural? I think there are certain shapes of it that are cultural, but I think in many ways it's universal, right? Um, I think the difficulty in facing death is universal. We might say Western culture does this. Western culture is very life forward. We have medical technology that can do amazing things to a point, uh, but that doesn't necessarily define everyone across the globe who still sees death as something that we can avoid or something that's unexpected. If I'm a Norse warrior, I want to die on the battlefield with my ax in hand so I can dine in Valhalla. You know, like some people, some some cultures uh, did more than celebrate uh, death and see it as the almost like the finish line in a good way. As we look at it as the finish line, we don't want to touch. Yeah. So the uh, interesting part about that is when you look cultures that are that death facing, those cultures are gone. Yeah. They have died out. So the things that persist are the ones that still try and see death as something we just don't do or we don't aspire for. We're not going to run towards it. Even if we acknowledge that door's there, we're not running towards it. We're not sprinting towards it. But then even with those cultures, there is that uh, existence of two very dissonant things within that same space. There is joy and sorrow. You know, things that I tell families um, after their loved ones have died is you're going to feel terrible and you're going to want to see those things that are joyful and be like, I shouldn't feel that. Yeah. I feel guilty if I feel good. I feel guilty. guilty. That's right. <laughs> if I enjoy, if I laugh because I'm supposed to be sad, I'm supposed to cry, I'm supposed to be miserable. But those things have to exist at the same time and they can. You can't separate them. And human beings struggle with these opposite, these polar opposite feelings in the same space. I will say that, and it could be every culture, but the cultural norms are just that. Oh, no, we are here to grieve and mourn, and that is all. And we do that in a solemn way and where we all put our heads down and, you know. And I, I really appreciate what, what you're saying, Rachel, when you're saying I'm still trying to figure that out in terms of what's, what's going to What the triggers me. are? Yeah. Um, I can't, there's a, a TV show that I can't watch anymore because- that was our thing. Can I ask which one? <laughs> I almost don't want to tell you. <laughs> he really is trying to trigger you. You don't have to make <laughs> her right. cry more. That's my job. <laughs> All right. I make people cry. Honestly, <laughs> and please, please laugh at this because it's hilarious. Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives on Food <laughs> Network, and it's on like a million times a week. Okay. You I know, was can't, definitely can't, thinking can't, something <laughs> more dramatic than that. That is freaking fantastic. Listen, I went as Guy Fieri for Halloween. I'm good. <laughs> 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 that's that's a different episode. But what if I tell you there exists the possibility that one day Someday you will, will. watch and that show and you're not going to you're not going to have a traumatic response to it although you might. But right. one day you might watch that show and go Tom and I watched this and I love that we shared this. That was our thing. It's it's on and if you've turned on Food Network on Fridays at all, it's on for like 36 hours straight, honestly. <laughs> but um, that was our thing, Friday night. That was our tradition. And the work week with order a pizza or pick up takeout on the way home and and plan out all these elaborate travel plans and, and um, hey, when we retire, what if we got a food truck? We're not going to get a food truck. That's not retiring. But what if we did? Yeah. And so I can't, I'm not ready to watch it yet. Yeah. And that's okay. Someday. And I think the two of you can identify those, some triggers. You can identify this is yeah. absolutely going to remind me of what I have lost. But then there's things you're never going to know that are going to creep up. Okay. Things that even Shannon and I might have for patients we've seen, because you never you never know in our line of work, which patients do we carry with us after they're gone. Yeah. Um, it could be, it may not be somebody who we've known for years. It might be somebody who we've known for a week that hits us the hardest. Yeah. But the unexpected ones, maybe it's a smell. Maybe it's something that just triggers some part of our brain that goes, okay, uh, here we are again. But over time, over time, because uh, I think you asked, so is this normal? So the DSM at some point, I could be wrong uh, for psychological, whatever, it stated, you know, beyond this arbitrary number of six months, 
is not normal, to grieve where it's impeding in your life. Beyond six months, if you are struggling to maintain this normal semblance of life, that's a problem. But before that, but who, I, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be the first one to swear. Who the fuck came up with that number? <laughs> because who's to say yeah. your grief is going to last three months, six months, or a year? I, I really think that you could have 100 people who have experienced a loss 100 different ways, and it's going to manifest itself in a 1,000 different ways. Yes. Like, I don't... I, I had an unexpected trigger pop up just like two weeks ago, and it was, it was actually something awesome that happened. Um, it was... I had a great day. Like I said, I'm a preschool teacher. Mm. Had a great day at the office, which is the playground. <laughs> um, but we had we had something really fun happen, and my first instinct was, I cannot wait to tell him about this. Mm. And I like, and then my second instinct was, I'm really fucking mad that I can't tell him about this. Right. And I cried all the way home. And. I cried all the way to work the next morning, and they actually said, Rach, if you need the afternoon, it's okay to go, um, which thank you for that. Um, but that one, it was something great, Yeah, and I was upset about it. So they are hiding everywhere. Portia, I don't know if you can think of something specific, but I remember talking to you, and Portia like like me, Portia and I are very similar in that we use humor, and 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 I think humor is a beautiful thing in the grieving process, uh, and not necessarily callous humor, but like making light of things. And you would make jokes and be like, "Molly would have loved that," but what what would trigger you was the most innocuous thing. But like she could make big jokes about big things, and and it's it, that's why it just shows it's so unique. The grief is so unique to each person. Do you remember any of? Uh, I mean, you don't have to think specifics, but but I feel like that was, was a good joke. Come on, yeah. <laughs> you know what? That's what I should have done in in the outline. Every five minutes, we tell a really like inappropriate joke. Break. And laugh. Oh my goodness! I, I can't think of one of the ones I made post, but um, toward the end, um, she'd suffered, um, but she could you know open her eyes and things like that. And I came to see her after not seeing her for a few weeks. And her dad and I were sitting there and we were laughing. And he's like, come on, get out of bed. We need to go work out and things. And I'm like, yeah, there's this pole dancing class. And suddenly you just see her shoulders <laughs> like going up, you know, like. That's awesome. Yeah. But but it, it does hurt to think of something funny that you want to tell that person in particular. And you can. I almost, I almost feel like I have a bingo card. Like, yeah. okay, well, here is the smell of, you know, a certain smell. Or here is a certain meal, or a TV show, or a holiday, or whatever. And I feel like I'm marking things off as we go along. So that's interesting that you use the bingo card as kind of the visual. <laughs> so what what I will will teach sometimes is when you look at grief, imagine like a box with a button, and it's a very small box, and this ball is in the middle of it and it bounces, and every time it hits this button, you have this intense sensation of grief it hits it so it's small hits it hits it over time what happens that button doesn't go away but the box does eventually get bigger right so maybe it's bouncing around and then it hits it maybe it gets a little bigger and then it bounces around and then it's so the idea is that grief is going to still be there it's gonna you're gonna carry it but eventually less and less are you having those triggers where you're, you're having that huge emotional response the inability to function the inability to face whatever's in front of you, um, which is normal. It's very normal, right? I love that analogy. I've actually um, seen it before, and I, th I just think it's so, it's so accurate, and it's so useful to think, because this is, and I think you said the, you know, the new normal. Um, that's one of the things that was very difficult for me when I lost my dad. Um, he passed away in 2014, and it was, it was pretty quick. He was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer in August and passed away in November, so it was real fast. He was young. He was 63. You know, okay, you know, people came to calling hours and we had the funeral and it was right around the holidays too, November, December, leading right into everything else. And so for a couple of weeks, you know, people checked on us and, you know, made sure we were fed and watered and, and, and standing upright most days. And, um, and then everybody else gradually went back to their own thing. 
They went to their holiday parties. They had shopping to do. There were, you know, year-end projects to wrap up. And my family, my immediate family, my mother and my sister and brother-in-law and I had, we we couldn't go back to right. normal. We couldn't go back to anything. Right. It was the only way, the only way out was through. That's one of my favorite, favorite Robert Frost quotes where the best way out is always through. Um, but it, it struck me that people go back to their things and you're left with, okay, I have to go back, but detour. I have to shift gears yeah. and kind of take a different route. And it's, I don't know. It's, is it is it it's a, a feeling change. of isolation too? Because you're saying everyone else goes back to their lives. Do you feel isolated in that you're still stuck in that grief and they're not there in that space with you anymore? Or is it more just, that's all fine and dandy. You guys get to go back to normal. But like, I'm about to do this like obstacle course with a bunch of booby traps and I have no idea what I'm doing. I, I don't know that it's isolating. I, Portia, do you, do you think so, isolating? I don't think it's isolating. I think it's, in my mind, it's when people stop pitying you that they stop reaching out. Because like when it first happened, a lot of people were reaching out and wanted, and were open to you talking about it. Yeah. And then after the funeral, I think a lot of people, like once the funeral's done, they assume that you're okay. Like, up, oh, right. the worst is behind yeah. them. It's, there was your closure. Let's go. Yeah. Well, okay. So Not, and, well, and and I know, I, that's, that sounds callous, but you know what I mean. And, and that's what I was going to say. I, I, and I think I'm guilty of that, too. I but think it's we part of society. It's part of where I want to eventually go in this discussion, too, is kind of like how people, because we are so awkward, most of us. How do we, I don't, uh, they're going through, uh, I don't want to rock the boat. And, and uh, what you guys are saying is absolutely correct. And they're not saying that, uh, fuck you for not calling me anymore. No, absolutely But how not. do you establish the new normal, right? It, that's how, a very difficult how move, do you yeah. How do you enable or, or support in, in finding your new normal? Yeah. When I had to plan Tom's funeral mass, um, I sat down with a funeral director and he asked me point blank and said, listen, you know, are there certain things that you want me to kind of help be the buffer for? And I didn't, I didn't really know what to ask for. Sure. Uh, because, yeah. Um, but I said, I don't, I don't know. I was like, people are going to ask me how I am, and I don't know what to say. And he's like, here's what I always tell people. And I don't know if I can. I don't want to give you know free shout out or anything, but free shout out. Free shout out. Free shout you out. It. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle Van Horn at <laughs> at Hummel Funeral Home in Copley, Ohio. <laughs> Bless his heart, because he said. He always tells people, don't ask her today what you can do. Don't check on her today. Check on her in a month. Sure. Check on her in six months. Check on her on the 4th of July. Check yeah. on her, you know, whatever. Like, if it crosses your mind to ask her how she's doing, do it. And I think that is the most beautiful thing that we can do for people. Hey, I thought of you today. Yeah. I'd like to know how you're doing. Um, I had another, I had a girlfriend say, I don't want to ask you too much about him because I don't want to remind you of it. Mm. And I was like, I, <laughs> yeah, I haven't thought of that in I, I literally, seconds. Shannon, I'm going to grab your hand here. I literally took her hand and I said, sweetie, uh, <laughs> it lives rent free right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you will never remind me of it. This is my new normal. So please, yes, ask me and, you know, be gentle about it. But yeah. Yeah. I think that there is this, a couple of things as everyone is talking, there is this notion of uh, cumulative unprocessed grief. So when I say processed grief, I, you know, it, it's like, it's sort of like this. Um, if I have a broken arm, I know what to do. There are protocols. I know what right. to do. If my mind is, there's a gap in my mind, uh, you know, I know what to do. I know how to learn stuff. I know how to get instrumental knowledge, all of that sort of stuff. Um, it is a, a very hidden curriculum when we talk about the protocols for a broken heart, how does one heal that? And I don't want to sound like a Bee Gees song, but it, but it is the truth. Please do. You know, I got... Could you sing your next few <laughs> sentences? Well, <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> and, 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 and one is the loneliest number. So what I'm getting at, <laughs> so what I'm getting at is there are the, the protocols uh, of a broken heart. How, well, what is it that we do with that? And in some ways there are, uh, there are processes, maybe ways to honor, um, but 
but in some way it's uncharted territory because each new loss is representative of the uniqueness of yours and Tom's relationship. Yours and Molly's, is that right? So unique that it demands, like what are the constants? Um, reflection, thinking about it, uh, remembering, bringing it up. What does this mean? Those are the constants. Um, what are the outcomes? Oh, unique to every one of us, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, the, so many of these protocols uh, that I would work with with folks have to do with um, what are the things that, damn it, left, were left unsaid and finding ways in which to honor those things that were left unsaid, uh, finding ways to discharge uh, these notions of motherfucker, I was pissed at you when you did that, and I never said it, and now I'm going to say it. Like it is, it is bringing current the relationship. I, I was uh, blah 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 raised in generational poverty, and one of the things that people used to uh, we used to say as kids when people would, would ask how you doing, and I would say well, I'm current, which means they weren't going to turn off my electricity, mm-hmm. they weren't going to repossess my car, and my my rent was current. Right? Um, relationships can be that way. How do we bring current the relationships that matter to us and the level of courage it takes to do that? So those are the those are some of the ways to put joy and sorrow in the same box by living currently, uh, to be current in our relationships rather. I want, so it's interesting you say in terms of defining relationships, right? So as we live, we experience loss of relationships in multiple mm-hmm. in multiple ways. One of them obviously being death. Sometimes we are together as a couple and we break up. Sometimes we are estranged. Those are our loss of relationships. Mm-hmm. So what sets death apart? What what makes that different? Permanency. Permanency. What does that mean that you're going to find an ex and be like, hey, it's been a minute, but can we rebuild what we had? The opportunity is there. The opportunity is there. With death, it's there is no... There is no possibility. I, I agree a thousand percent. I told Shannon this a long time ago, and, and it's what's funny is what used to be the bane of my existence is now the thing that through grief and everything else has been the beauty that I've tried to grab onto, which is impermanence. I hated the idea that life was so impermanent and that situations were impermanent. And I'm not an overly nostalgic person. I just, I have a hard time appreciating situations sometimes until they become the good old days. And now in, in, in my own grief, that is not a death grief. I am like, there's a beauty in kind of like the fact that shit doesn't last forever. Not only does the bad shit not last forever, but this good shit's not going to last forever. But that also means there's some other good shit that might show up. And that is one of those things that if not for grief, I wouldn't have figured that out. Uh, in um, uh, Lord of the Rings, or maybe the Cimmerillion, I don't remember which, but it okay, talks Rachel, about- Okay, Rachel, Lord of the Rings uh, is- um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure. So, no, in, in in one of the dude, in in one of the the narratives or descriptions, it it talks about the gifts that were given to the elves, the gifts that were given to these different the, you know, the dwarves, this kind of stuff. But the gift that was given to humankind was death, because it was from death that life mattered. And I mean that you know that's a hard. That's a, something hard to swallow, but but it is, again, lovely uh, at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. I'm running out of time. All estranged, frozen in their place, disappearing by the tracks inside my mind. When grief is the ailment, music is the medicine. This week's musician spotlight is on Liz Chidester of Liz and the Lovelies. Liz Chidester is a critically acclaimed and award-winning Americana singer, songwriter, actor, and all-around creative. Her band, Liz and the Lovelies, released Progress Into Simplicity, My Way, Your Way, Sleep In, and Great American Chestnut Tree, featured on NPR's All Songs Considered in 2020. Liz is a Jeff Award-winning and critically acclaimed actor called one of the most truthful actors in this city by the Chicago Tribune. She's currently working on a new project, Liz and Noko in NYC with her partner, Noko Andreas. You can check out all the socials and content from Liz Chidester and Liz and the Lovelies at their website, lizandthelovelies.com. In that wishing well 
Well, I'm a woman with endless sense of pride Full of stories, the things that never die I'll keep moving and I'll never go inside With people pumping pedals, maybe someday Because we're talking a lot about the people who, who are left to grieve, you know? Like in some ways, we envy the person we bury. Like, you lucky son of a bitch, you got out of this and I'm dealing with it. What does it look like to have people in your life in mind to ease some of that burden at the end of life? And, and this is something that, even as I'm writing this outline, I'm kicking myself like, son of a bitch, I was supposed to write this thing up. Like a living will, right? A couple of things as we start, as we start thinking, well, how do I live um, uh, after, or even e even as you're going before? It is you you say the stuff that needs to be said. There's that. N now, there is um, there's a way to ask. What do you need that doesn't make you feel needy? Because you have your own sort of like I I you want to be perceived. I imagine a certain way. And so um, when we ask, what do you need? Sometimes that, that's hard to get to. Um, sometimes it's also easy to ask, what is it that you want? What would you like right now? And, and oftentimes when people ask that in our hospital context, they'll say, I want them not to have died. Or I want them. Uh, so given the parameters of our reality, it is what do you want? And then those that come alongside and help co-construct, co-create, something going forward that both honors, that that tempers and stays where you're at going forward, right? Paces it. Um, and, and who the hell knows how long it takes? Because it doesn't, it, it's it's not about that. It, if, if any of us have a vision of what would it feel like when I am on the other side of this, mm -hmm. right? Um, that is self-reporting. Uh, but I remember for me it was, I want to remember them without being debilitated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to be wiser, kinder, gentler, more current. Like, like I had a vision, not of what I wanted to happen, but who I wanted to be on the other side of this. And that's some of the work that can happen uh, in relationship. Sure. And we all remember the early 2000s. Ter Terry Schiavo is all yeah. over the news. Mm -hmm. It's this big blown up thing. And it, of course, was a an extreme circumstance. And uh, people got the media involved. And it, it started this whole battle of uh, the feeding tube and what do yeah. we do. And Luke, can you speak to oh, kind goodness. of that and how you can make those decisions while you're alive so that your family doesn't have to. Yeah, yeah. so that's a big thing. And I think the importance of this really is when we talk about who's left behind, guilt. Guilt. I, I don't want I don't want families to feel guilty of the what of, what did I do what they wanted? Did I do the right thing? Shoulda, coulda, woulda? That's not fair. That's not fair to you. Um, and that's not fair for someone to enable their loved ones to feel after they're gone, right? Um, what should we do when we talk about medical te technology? What could we do? What should we do? You know, um, and it, it is so immensely important, I think, to think about these measures as younger folks, not even as older people who have terminal illnesses, right? right. If, I'm, if I'm 80, 90, is it more appropriate for me to have a, a DNR or do not resuscitate? Because CPR is not going to be helpful. It's just going to cause harm. Yeah, it's important at that point. When I'm younger, is it more helpful to have that? Or something that says, hey, if I get stuck and I can't tell you what I want, can I help provide guidance? Because as a young person, if you get put on a ventilator, if you get put in a vegetative state, your body is young enough and there are pieces and parts in your body that might work so well, you have years as opposed to months yeah. to live in that state, right? And you have people who have to deal with that acute trauma of maybe we shouldn't have died, maybe they shouldn't have died because they're so young. We have lost the remainder of their life. So those, those are advanced directives. And not, not advanced as in, hey, we're well beyond, but advanced as in we're doing this in advance of getting sick. Yeah. And there's really two big pieces of that. Uh, one is a living will. 
And those can be done by state by state basis because state law actually dictates what is legal, what can we do by all this. It's not a national thing. It is, in fact, depends on where you live. So a living will is helpful and that is provides some guidance of what would your wishes be if you're in this particular situation? What are Ohio's specific ones? Like, you don't have to go through every single thing, but like specifically, are there a few things that might differ? Uh, so the big thing for our, from state to state is just who is your legal next of kin if you don't have a living will or a healthcare power of attorney? Is that, and I'm assuming some of there's politics as well? It's a, there's a lot of politics. There's a lot yeah. of right to life things of right. uh, um, that I'd, is not fun to talk about. Uh, well, but, you're on the right podcast. Yeah, exactly. You can say whatever the hell you want. No, it's it's yeah. so that you know. The, it, truthfully, that whole movement started for those with developmental delay, and that kind of grew beyond that to start infringing upon those who uh, have their cognition intact from birth, who still wish to lay down advanced directives. Right. Yeah. So, so that there, there's that. Um, for Ohio, I'll speak to Ohio, you know, they have a kind of a standard form living will. The verbiage is not helpful. It's like if I get into a vegetative state or un permanently unresponsive or terminal state, nobody in medicine actually goes, you're in a terminal state. You're in a permanently unresponsive state because it takes many, many months of being unresponsive and already on a ventilator to truly determine that in the medical chart. Right. I can't help but ask this question. Who came up with that term? I don't know. The vegetative term? No, I mean, yeah. Was it lawyers? Was it politics? That's kind a great question. Because that goes into some other medical, like uh, you know, people find you insane. Like, like uh, some, of the, sure, capacity. some of the things that we've seen. Do they have capacity, with, um, informed consent, all that stuff. With, yeah. uh, with women's health care and, and, and uh, abortion and stuff. Exactly. There are terminology that n no doctors, like I would... What the fuck are they talking about? So that, I mean, that's why I try to use the most appropriate clinical term. So yeah. permanently unconscious state. You're not awake, you're not aware, or you might be awake, you're not aware. Vegetative is a colloquial term, right? Yeah, That's exactly. not going to be in the, in, uh, well, it might be in That sounds like thing. something out of a Borat movie where it's like, your wife is carrot. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, even, even when we talk about terms, uh, we try and normalize the term dying instead of passing away or expiring yes because yeah. expiring people, that's always the one that's creeped me out no the most. people it's like bad milk <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> milk expires yes. gas is passed people die right <laughs> so that's that's how you break that apart and we that's do awesome. i think you just named the episode that's fantastic <laughs> i guess i'll take it uh, but that but that living will that that forum is is really ambiguous and it's not medically helpful what is more helpful in that living will is the portion that says healthcare power of attorney. So that is a yeah. person that you name to be your surrogate decision maker. If you're in a medical situation where you can't voice your own uh, desires for this or that, which could be thousands of different scenarios. Right. It's impossible to come up with all of them, even a fraction of them. Which is why I think it's also hard to put yourself in that mindset. Well, if, if I'm a uh, potato, you know, like what do I want to have? How could I possibly even you think about that? You can't. So the conversation then becomes, what did they value in yes. their life? What was most important to them? Right. Did they, would they find a life where they could not talk or eat worth living? Would they find a life where they, would they be okay if they couldn't do that, but they're okay with being able to watch a movie? Would they be okay with being able to play a video game? Um, so, so what are those limits? Where's that line drawn? And that's where the ongoing discussion happens because the documents themselves are there to help name the decision maker, but all the hard work has to be done before that's even done, right? Right. So the, so the healthcare power of attorney, anyone can fill out. Mine is my boss. It's not even my wife, who I trust my wife and I love her very much, but it would be very difficult for her to carry out the wishes that she knows and she's, she's so in tune with it, would do. But mine is, I guess, was my boss. She's a colleague of mine because not only does she know the medicine, um, she will not hesitate to speak up on my behalf. Uh, and she can navigate some of those really, really difficult decisions. And hopefully you didn't put her in your actual will because otherwise she might be gearing for your death. <laughs> well, we joke about that. I say, if you <laughs> you keep me alive, you still keep me as an employee or if I'm doing something wrong, you, you, you know, pull the plug. Um, but yeah, it, it, it really is that conversation. So naming the person 
is first and having the conversation is ongoing because it starts when you're young yeah and that conversation changes because our goals change over time right right what i what is acceptable and what might be my goal at 30 might be different at 50 might be different at 70. for somebody with a terminal illness for example my goal is with cancer is to treat the cancer and live longer over months to maybe a year or two, maybe that is, I want to be able to walk and go to the grocery store. Maybe months to a year after that, things have changed and the goal is, I don't wanna hurt so much. Maybe the goal after that is, let me go peacefully with my family nearby, right? So those goals are a spectrum. True. It's never one thing. So so, so those conversations and, and those documents exist to help facilitate that spectrum of goals. Um, so what happens too, because life changes, right? Let's say uh, your your spouse is your power of attorney, but then you get divorced or it's your uh, brother and uh, you guys have a falling out. So this is where state law becomes really important. By Ohio law, the first alternate is your spouse, right? So if you're married- It defaults to your spouse. Defaults. So okay, if you don't sure. have a living will, you don't have a power of attorney, it is your spouse. And we've seen that play out in the media about weird situations where people were uh, separated and they hadn't talked in months and, and the new girlfriend or boyfriend is like closer to the person. That and, is real. I got to yes. tell you. So there was Goodness one time yes. where I had to find um, a spouse who had been still married, but estranged for 30 years and they had kids. And I could not find him. The only way I could is by snooping because you become very good at right. becoming a detective That's online. Right. And I found a colleague of their daughter at Temple University. So I emailed this colleague who got in touch with the daughter who moved to Mexico, who got in touch with the spouse who lived Jesus, in Philadelphia. Jesus, so you have to be a detective too. Wow. I, this, was, this was a shining moment in my detective <laughs> career. I am very proud of it. And, 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 <laughs> and they, the son who the mom lived with and the daughter from Mexico all came into Akron and were very, very present. And it was, you know, it, it was actually beautifully done. They were very attentive, even though they had all been estranged from this yeah. patient for 30 years. Uh, but it is that spouse. After that, um, it, well, if you're not married or don't, were never married, it becomes your adult children and consensus thereof, meaning children over 18. Uh, and if you have three kids, two may overrule the one. So the majority, it doesn't have to be all of them. After that, it is your parents. But most of the time, parents parents are, are deceased. First, right? After that, it becomes anyone, any family that you could find. After that, it's kind of like who's next willing door to step neighbor, up. and then it's your mailman. Yeah. yeah, I mean that could be the case. I mean, right. if, if there is literally no family, and usually there's um, hospitals have uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Ethics committees. Ethics committees yeah, so right, I, yeah. I don't know the word of ethics. Yeah. <laughs> um, Never I had happen, to use it. <laughs> I happen to be on this ethics yeah. committee. I can't name it, but. <laughs> <laughs> who, who to help navigate those situations, right? Um, so if you have named your spouse and your power of attorney and they in your divorce, it's still the spouse, but they can say no. Sure. They can't say who to go to. That's Ohio law, but they can say no. I could never imagine being in that situation. Like even if you're somebody who was a shitty spouse, you know, like, and they came to you, like, I, I would never, I would never want to make that call for anybody. I had, when I had to put my dog down, he was sick. They told me he was going to die and we knew it was coming. And still I picked up the phone and I dialed the number and they answered and I couldn't speak. And I, and I handed it to my wife at the time. And I was like, you're going to have to make this call. I literally cannot bring myself to do it. And it wasn't, you know, if this was a human with a will that said, do not resuscitate, like tell them, pull, pull the plug kind of thing. I still don't know that I could bring those words out of my mouth. I could only imagine what that takes. So one of the things that um, I am privy to, uh, that I get to enjoy watching, is the, uh, the healing presence of our palliative physicians. Because what they do is they navigate those conversations so that the onus is not on uh, the surrogate decision maker as much. Um, even if they have to make, even if the, the, the ones dedicated have to make the call, uh, or have to say yes, no, or whatever. Our palliative docs are uh, incredibly gentle at being able to say to them things like, this is not your decision. This is his or her body 
declaring itself. There are these ways in which it can be reframed so that somebody doesn't feel like they're responsible for it. And uh, Luke will not talk about his expertise that way, uh, but there is such a giftedness to have somebody in a position of uh, medical prowess to give us permission to say, honestly, it's time. That, that is a magic, sacred moment. I would absolutely agree with that because I had to be the one to make that decision yeah. for for our situation. And was that discussed ahead of time? Was he, there Yes. And if if anybody watching or listening takes anything away from this, have the discussions. Yes. They're hard, but have the discussions. We didn't have anything formal in writing, but he and I had talked um here and there about, you know, what ifs, you know, the what ifs. Yeah. And I feel very grateful that I was able to honor what we had talked about. Yeah. Um, in the moment, not so grateful because it kind of sucked. It kind of sucked like the worst thing ever in my entire life. Um, but I echo that entirely. Like there was um, the head of the ICU um, said to me, he's like, this is, he's like, you, you're you doing what you and he already talked about. He used the word honor. He, you are honoring the conversation that you and he had. So please, people, have the talks. Oh, my gosh. Can I say right now, I don't know if this is legally binding, but for whoever watching, <laughs> if I, Matt Pilata, am ever in a vegetative state, pull the plug. And delete his text. I'm but you know you can't it. say vegetative state because then you have to be declared a vegetative state. If I am ever in a state less than perfection, <laughs> pull the fucking plug. Uh, Thank oh, you. man, you're in danger this afternoon. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, but but, but that's, a, that's a great point. So like the yeah. what ifs mm -hmm. are what so ifs. huge. And this is the, usually I present it. And I do say, you know, uh, we're honoring their decision. We're honoring what they would want. Mm -hmm. But but the what ifs, that that's what my career is kind of built on yeah. is predicting the future um, as best I can, right? Even if it's not now, six months from now, they're gonna come back and say, oh, I remember when you said this, and now we're back here again in the hospital. But so the what if, so let's say everything works out and I like to use best case scenario. In the best case scenario, medically, the outcome is living in a nursing home. Yeah. Are you okay with that? Would they be, would they be okay with that? Yeah. In the best case scenario, Let's say they have a trach, tracheostomy and a ventilator. They might get off of that ventilator, but they might never be able to have the tracheostomy root and are going to struggle with talking and or eating. They're never going to eat again. Um, so, the, so those what ifs are huge. Huge. Best case scenarios, huge. And you think best case scenario, but I think the person in that room is only thinking worst case scenario, which is I tell them to go ahead and, and shut off the ventilator. And then we realized this person would have lived longer. And I, 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 can, I can say from personal experience and being around people, like that is where your mind goes immediately. What if I make the worst decision ever? But that's why you say best case scenario. Exactly. It's and that's why, why you, you have advanced directives. Scenario. And yeah. that's why you put all that together. Because the surrogate decision maker, they don't really have authority. Yeah. The surrogate decision maker is, is only, their authority only it lasts as long as they are fulfilling the patient's wishes. Yeah. They're not allowed, all of a sudden, they're not the new sheriff in town. Right? So you, I'm going to bring this back to, you know, yeah. you're talking about Lord of the Rings and Cimmerillion yeah. and all that stuff. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, Rachel. So <laughs> she's a bigger nerd than she's letting <laughs> on today. I'm a huge nerd. That's, just, that's my likelihood. Um, so the voice of Sauron. <laughs> Right? That's not Sauron, but that is the voice thereof. So really, yeah. we are all kind of acting in that capacity yes. as the voice of Sauron. Yes. <laughs> That's right. That's awesome. That's right. That's so exactly it. So whatever decisions are made, the person you care about is gone and you're sad and you have this hole in your heart and it feels like, you know, you used to hear the, as a kid, you hear the love songs about a hole in the heart and all this. And you never understand it until you yeah. have your heart broken. right -o. And then there's this void and, and you try to go on. And as you do, as you guys were talking about, the people around you, even the people who are the best people of being in those murky waters with you are still like, I don't fucking know what to say or do. And I'm afraid to text or maybe I should call or maybe I should leave her alone. From somebody who's in it, because it's easy to talk about after, but it was from somebody who's in it. And even here a moment ago is like, you guys are good? Okay. We'll see you at the family reunion, right? And we know it's it's not about bad intentions. 
Yeah. It's about what we've been talking about this whole time, which is the complete ignorance and at sea mindsets of how to deal with the grieving people, not our own grief. This is about from a third party going, I have no idea what Rachel needs from me right now. And I'm afraid if I give her attention and what she wanted was space, now I've triggered her, right? I think the biggest thing is remembering that. So if you're the kind of person who is always the go-to person and always the strong person for other people, they have a hard time understanding that there is a time when you need support. And yes. for me, that was the huge. hardest thing. Yes. That's huge. It was recognizing, no, I didn't wash towels today. No, <laughs> I didn't cook dinner because I, I did good getting out of bed today. So just people remembering that yeah. even the strong, you know, need that grace, if nothing else, just the grace to be like, okay, today I'm not strong. Today I cannot handle it. Today I cannot function and be okay with me being okay with that, that I could have used a little bit more understanding in that, in that way. Yeah. Would, and this is a hard one because with, with my own experiences with depression, grief, um, really what helped me help keep me afloat. And this is through medical school, quite uh, honestly, where, where my friends that didn't necessarily ask and they said, we're going to, we're going to hang out tonight. Yeah. Yes. And even if I said no, yep. they still would ask, well, hey, we're going to hang out tonight. Yep. We're going to hang out tonight. Was that me? No, it was you. Well, you did the same for me. When I was going through a tough time, Portia would text me once a day, what'd you eat today? Mm. Mm. Because she knew when I get really depressed, not sad, sad Matt loves to eat, <laughs> depressed Matt forgets to eat, doesn't want to eat, doesn't care. And those are the people who it's like, even when you're like, fuck you, stop texting me, who you know love you beyond what you could even put into words. Um, I love being asked about him yes. um, and not, and not, oh my God, what happened? Not in that sense. I I have a good girlfriend I'm thinking of in in very specific terms here. She and I haven't seen each other in person because we you know we live far apart and everybody's everybody's busy. Um, but she started asking me. She's like, I don't even. They the two of them never met. Mm -hmm. She never met Tom, and she asked me, "How'd you guys meet? Yes. You know what was your first date? Yes. What's something that you that." He did that made you laugh, yeah. or what did he tease you about? And those questions, oh, those fill me up on days when I think because they they will pop up in texts or emails out of nowhere, and I'm like, oh man, today today sucked so hard, and then I get a little bing bong and it says, hmm. hey, what was his favorite color? You know, little dumb things because they're not little dumb, they're big and they're awesome, and the fact that somebody is helping me remember. I also, I've got, um, like when I think about losing my dad, um, there is a, I, I don't know if it's a legend or whatever it is, but they say that, you know, cardinals, the red birds are spirits of the people we've lost. And- That's um, science. That is actual fact. Look it up. Um, but I've got a girlfriend who I had mentioned that to after I lost my dad, you know, and this is going on almost a decade now. And sometimes she'll text me and say, hey, saw a cardinal today, thought of you and your dad. Mm. And I'm like, Awesome. That's what I need. Um, my dad was a Starbucks guy forever, and I have another friend who, you know, would always laugh about the way he was very particular about the positioning of the snap-on mm. lid. She'll get to coffee to go and send me a photo of her coffee lid, and I'm like, mm. I see you. <laughs> and I, those are the things that I live for. So start doing those for your friends, yeah. you know. And I, I try to do that for my for my people. <laughs> is is it the the opening away from the crease? If the uh, if the uh, opening uh, uh. is on the crease, it's gonna dribble. Yes. Yeah. Clearly. I learned Looking something up, new today. <laughs> but but I love Science. that for you. I love that they're giving you that space to have that as such a positive affirmation it's of huge. life. It's yeah. huge. Yeah. Right? It's huge. There is a there is a, a gift to be able to learn the griever. So uh, you know, um, you enter into things by asking the the better question, which is this this the stuff. How'd you guys meet? Uh, what was on Tom's playlist? Right. Uh, you know, <laughs> what's the stuff that pissed him off? What's yeah. the stuff that made him laugh? Like be, be, the 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 questions like that that sometimes people feel like, oh my God, I'm gonna trigger her to memory. It's mm -hmm. no no no. It's gonna that is the way that the wound is being healed because what we learn is 
it is impossible for Tom to leave you. Mm -hmm. You're just experiencing him in a different way. Mm -hmm. And it's not better. <laughs> it's not better. And it's not, you know, it, it, it's no replacement. But it is impossible for you to forget Tom. Mm -hmm. He is in yourselves, right? Um, and uh, and nor should him. I don't. I don't. Nor you or anybody want you to forget him because uh, uh, it sounds like a lovely soul. I wear his wedding ring with mine, and um, I've mentioned I'm a preschool teacher. And a couple of weeks ago, one of the most beautiful moments happened for me. We were out on the playground, and one of the little girls grabbed my hand and said, "Miss Rachel, hmm. what's this?" And I said, "Well, that's my." engagement ring and that's my wedding ring and that's Mr. Tom's wedding ring and one of the other teachers heard it and she was like I thought that's what that was and I just wanted to you know I, I didn't want to ask but since you said it and we had a lovely little conversation and it was beautiful it was this beautiful moment out of nowhere check on your people <laughs> let them let them talk about it <laughs> I, I just have to ask about it and it's it's an ironic answer that you're going to give but you shared a funny term with me through text, which was... Oh, trauma porn. Yeah. yeah. There, there is a fine line. Um, I mean, <laughs> there is a fine line because I, I do love being asked about him. And I love it when people ask me about my dad, but I also don't want to feel like a sideshow. Yeah. I don't want to feel like a, a curiosity. Like, yeah. I don't want it to turn into... Um, a podcast session with four cameras on you I don't want to and have, a like, full panel. Me, and me a camera here, like, oh she my God, me. what happened? I don't know if that was a phone call or text. And I was like, you mean like a podcast? And she goes, no, Matt, that's me choosing to do right. this. You, that's you were like, difference. is it hypocritical yeah. if we're making you do this in front of yeah. tens of viewers? There's something oh. voyeuristic, oh. though. <laughs> no, you know, there's something yes. voyeuristic yes. about um, like I I want to share this with you. I want to be there with you because I know you and I know I don't know time or no time or whatever. But to be present to it, not for the for the purpose of honest, genuine healing curiosity versus oh my God, she's not out of the woods yet. Yeah, right. it's going to be a little bit longer. Like, ooh, what happened? Or versus... so that somebody could go and say, oh my God, yeah. Do you know what happened to my friend Rachel? Yeah. Or on social yeah. media. Oh, social media is the worst. Thing in my mind because when my friend died, everyone had to post it and everyone was in my inbox. How did she die? Not hey, how are you? Not yeah. <laughs> there's there's something and I I'm sure like I love that ball in the button yeah. that you teach as well. Um, the ring theory, like if you think of the person at the center of it, okay, and then think of it like a bullseye. And so like here is the the patient or the one who is about to pass or immediately deceased or whatever, and then think. You've got their spouse or their children or whoever, their immediate. And then there, you've got their parents. And then you've got their f close friends. And then you've got their work colleagues and then everybody else. And it's comfort in dumping out. And that's another thing too. Like when people ask, you know, what do you need? Yeah. You probably have no- Did you know what yeah. you needed right. immediately? No. Absolutely not, my and goodness. Now there's another job for you to come up with a to-do list right. for all your well-wishers. Right. I think there's a recognition, not just for you, but for everyone around you of what role is that too? Like where where do I fall on that spectrum? Yeah. It's a hard one to find it, out. It, it really is. And and you said something earlier that honestly almost brought me to tears when you said, Tom, I want to go back and talk to the friends that he made and the people. Um, because- those that's the role that I play with with my patients, and that's the role that I kind of carry. And I will fully admit, I'm I'm the I'm the worst one on the opposite side because I do want to know the details because I'm so close to the medical side that I want to know and I want to process it. And I kind of I don't want to say hide behind it, but that's how I can face that. But after one of my patients dies, I and they say. I have colleagues and and learners, and they say, should I should I go to their funeral? And I say, yeah, it's entirely up to you. That's entirely up to you and, and on your relationship. I can't. I can't because that portion of my relationship with them has ended. And I am not the person that's going to be, like you said, on uh, the healthy part of that bullseye because I want to know. But also, I don't know if I would emotionally be able to handle it. Um, and you, 
I said before, you know, you never know which patients you carry that are going to cause that trauma. So it's awesome when you find people who have cared for your loved ones and want to be like, how are you doing? Do you remember this? Do you remember that? And I know so many of them that I work with and they're wonderful human beings. And I know I'm not one of them <laughs> <laughs> um, I, because I, I'm not going to think of that way. And if I try to do that, uh, I will, I will cry and I will break down and I will be an added burden. Sure. Um, and I wrote something many, many years ago about a, a patient who I had uh, about our encounter where she was admitted to the hospital and she was so sick. She was so sick. And she had a thing where she'd have these kind of bouts of pain, nausea, vomiting, and it would just happen. And I'm there and it's like late. It's dark outside. And she gets sick and, I, and I'm like, do you want me to step out? She goes, yes, please. So she's, you, I can hear her. And after it was over, I came in and I sat down on the bed and I'm, you know, white coat and scrubs and whatever. And she puts her arm and like just kind of leans in and um, and cries and just cries on my shoulder. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to cry uh, because I love her. I really do. And um, I didn't. I didn't in that moment because I said, she, that's not what she needs right now. That's not what she needs. So I will carry that. And and I said, it's okay that you do. And she goes, everybody just needs a little cry now and again. And she was done. She was over it. She kind of like let that wash through. And I took care of her when she got home until she died. And I could not go. I had her before she was on hospice and after as a patient. And I could not go to her funeral. I could not go. I couldn't face that. Um because it's just how the, the path that we walked, right? So it, it, knowing knowing who you are and, and knowing your role and being supportive to the family, because I met her kids and I met her husband, is so important to that. Um, and on a caregiver side too, when we're doing that, knowing, God, am I really enmeshed? <laughs> um, that's so hard. It's hard to know. It's hard to recognize and it takes a lot of work to, to do that. To even just figure that one out, right? But I think it. I think it goes to say, like uh, grace. I think one of you mentioned it's just that grace of the the answers are so ambiguous. You know, it's like I should I do this? What if I don't do this? And I think um, you know the people who you care about enough to know they're going to know I'm trying to show love when I do this, even if I fuck up. Like mm -hmm. it's the that thought that counts and. You guys have touched on this, and I have to say, like, it's beautiful that you said sometimes you just have to cry, and the idea of you have to go through, that's the only way. And I don't know if you're there yet, and I don't know if you've been through it, but I can say from my own personal experience in grief that there are times where it's like, I just kind of need to be sad for a little bit. And it's, it's weird because you feel masochistic in the way you're like, I'm all, I almost want to feel so I, like you know those moments of like where sinking into it feels really fucking good that's and, that's me right now like i'm a huge proponent of therapy talk therapy for sure but i'm for sure in my mind talk therapy is how you heal i'm not ready to heal yet Bingo. i want to hurt i want i want to remain this raw yes. because i need to feel every bit of this like you said it almost sounds like i like torture but i i feel like i need to feel this that's a separate episode but i do yes <laughs> well so there's i mean there's processing what you're doing is you're processing your grief and there's a balance of uh, uh, there's two very unhealthy things we can do with grief one is hold it and keep it away and you never get a chance to process it and it stays there and it just festers the other is when it hits you you don't let it go and you never do anything with it you just there it is. Uh, and, and again, it sits there and it festers and it becomes unhealthy. The, the, the way that it, we talk about emotions that is healthy that I truthfully had to learn in medical school um, through whatever reasons and grief and, and depression is you have to feel your emotions in order to process them. They have to go through you like a wave and you can't dissect it under a microscope. They, they're, they're emotions, right? They're inside of you. And you go through and you have to come through the other side. I, I think of Bruce Lee's quote of be like water, be mm. shapeless. Yeah. Um, 
you can adapt to every situation, but let that mold you because you are moldable. Once you become rigid, you become weak. And that is a beautiful sentiment. And it goes exactly to when you try to talk to other men who you feel like they're like, no, we need to be stoic and strong and, and, you know, and sometimes it is good to be that strong person. Like you said, the one who doesn't cry, even though you want to, but I, any of those people in my life, and they're not all men, there's some women who are like that, but it's like, what I think you're describing as strength is not strength, that you are like hurting yourself big time. Righto. Yeah, the the moving away from it um, as a um, as a way to self-protect. So although I, um, I'm, you know, I don't often talk about my, uh, my Christian faith, um, uh, because it matters and doesn't matter at the same time because grief is, grief is universal, right? So, um, but there is a, a way in which uh, I have understood uh, sorrow and sadness and grief and why you guys don't want to leave that space right now. Uh, in uh, Isaiah, the, one of the scriptures, Old Testament scriptures say that I will give you treasures in darkness, in riches in secret places. And you don't go there looking for them, but while you're in there, you say, I'm not going to leave until I, until I find it or until it, it, it declares itself to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is a faithful approach to our sadness. Uh, it is a, uh, uh, this will have its perfect work. Uh, and you cannot rush that. You can't bounce from it. Um, and so I, uh, I, I applaud this this sense that both of you have that says, no, 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 please don't rush me through this because uh, there is something uh, I'm not done. We're not done yet. Thank you for acknowledging that. But it's it's why I said at the outset here, I, I, I know I'm going to cry tonight, guys. Yes. Buckle up. Yeah. Um, and thank you for letting me sit in that. Thank you for sitting with me in it because that's sometimes, sometimes you just need to cry. Yeah. It's cathartic. It's and it is the uh, perseverance of the love that you two shared for Tom and for Molly and for the people who we've lost in our lives. I mean, that is, you are honoring that love and esteem that you had for these people. That's right. And if they come after you and say, it's been six months, stop crying, give them a swift kick in the jaw. <laughs> Speaking of, not only is six months too, too long for you to be grieving, <laughs> a few days is enough for you to go back to work and function as a human, God right? Help us all. I, what do you guys see in your profession? Are there people who are like, holy shit, I have to do this and this and this? And I mean, you guys even have to go back to work within minutes yeah. of sometimes feeling that. Maybe we have this tendency to do, uh, oh, this is, this is good and this is bad. And it's, it's less about that and more about context. So there are there are times when splitting is in incredibly important. Yeah. You have to split and put that stuff away and go to the next patient, go to the next family, go to the next this. Uh, sometimes that has to happen. The, the dilemma with that as a strategy, as a coping strategy, it's short term, oh, perhaps all right. As a long term strategy, what begins to happen is you get further and further away from the experience and then it drops below the consciousness. And that's why when people say like, oh, time heals all wounds. No, no, time delays it. Um, like it, it drops below consciousness and now it's driving behaviors and you don't know why. And so uh, splitting as a short-term solution contextually is, is important. We need to be able to do that. As a long-term healing process, God, no. um, it's, not, uh, it, it's not going to help. It'll sh come out sideways, all the things we've talked sure. about uh, in the past. So, yeah. And so... You went back to work, mm -hmm. and um, I'm assuming the first day back was like, oh my God, everything's so easy. This is just normal. Mm -hmm. I'm being very sarcastic. Yeah. Um, I am very lucky um, because my a lot of my colleagues are four years old. And so they're already crying. <laughs> and, <laughs> and wet into bed, all yeah. of it. <laughs> uh, no, not in my room, thank you very much. Um, but no, one of the beautiful things is that they accept simple explanations where sometimes grownups don't. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mr. Tom was here and now he's not. Mm -hmm. And they also understand that I'm going to be pretty sad for a while. 
And one of the most beautiful things that happened to me, um, I there's a little girl in my class who stuck to me that first week that I was back, stuck to me like glue, oh. like glue. And I finally, I was like, what? Mm. What gives? What's up, kid? Do you need, you know, what do you need? What do you need something? And she said, no, my mommy said, you're probably going to be pretty sad for a while. Huh. And I thought, yeah. Your mom ain't wrong, kid. Mm. And also, you get that, hey, Miss Rachel's going to be a little bit sad, so she might need a little extra yeah. leaven or just somebody to just be right there, just to be right, mm -hmm. just to walk right next to her and just, just in case. And I think that is just such a beautiful thing that we can do as grownups, we can do for each other. Right now, and this might be impossible to answer, when do you think you would have actually been ready to go back to work? Um, never. That's a, um, that's because it's because it's unpredictable. Fair answer. You know, exactly. we've said I I don't know that you're ever ready. I think you, I think things soften, okay. and I think you start to be able to. I hope <laughs> that you start to be able to um, anticipate triggers. But, you know, if not all of them, then some of them. I think if you're spending so much of your time avoiding <laughs> triggers, you're actually triggering oh, yourself in a whole right, way. but yeah. right, but. You know, like, okay, um, last week was tough for me. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, last week was tough for me because last week, um, Memorial Day week, was um, that was the week last summer where everything started to f go south. Yeah. So I knew that Memorial Day week was going to be hard. And so it's things like that. And like my birthday comes up this summer, and then I know that, you know, we'll, we'll have our wedding anniversary this fall and things like that. Um, but I, I don't know. I think t time doesn't hit heal everything time softens things for me anyway yeah the really sad thing and i'm not saying it should be this like free for all but culturally we have this idea that's like okay you've mourned and back to work you know and it sounds for you it's great I, you were, i'm fortunate in a yeah. lot of ways that a lot of people yeah. are not you're grieving <laughs> your friend you have some kleenex on your eye and uh there's no bereavement for that yes that's right and that's so hard and so one of the things that happened during COVID, and I, I actually love this story as much as I think most people actually get it. I tell it usually like, hold on, just, just wait. But it was like COVID time and one of our uh, actors came in and I was like, how's life? And he's like, it sucks. I was like, I know. He's like, no, no, no. This year has been the worst. This happened and this happened and this happened and I ran out of money and this happened. He goes, then my mom died. And I was like, I'm so sorry. He's like, you want to hear the fucked up thing? My dog died and that was way harder for me. And it just goes to show like, it is impossible, like you said, to like define this thing that is grief. And, and there is no amount of time or exact curriculum that you can put to these things on how to move past it or even know how they're going to affect you. I think there should be bereavement for losing a pet. You know, I, I, and, and maybe that's a, a company by company basis or something, but we put death so far out of mind that we refuse to even put any kind of like structure to it as far as the actual grieving and mourning process in a healthy manner. Cause to some people, like for me, I enjoyed distractions when I was grieving, mm -hmm. not right away, but like immediately, you know, sucked. And then I'm like, I need to go be around people because that I know that isolation is not going to help me right now. I know that that's what I feel like I want, but that's going to be bad, you know, but that's not everybody. And that's certainly not at any exact stage in it. I wish there was a way of, of being able to dip a toe in and being like, this is okay. I don't have the responsibility that I normally would. Maybe I'm helped with that. And if it's too much, I can back out and then dip a toe in again yeah. and kind of come back because uh, to Rachel's point, there is no such thing as being ready. Never am I going to be ready to go back until you try it and you go. Just like when lo losing somebody that you asked earlier in the uh, podcast, when at what point would you be ready to lose somebody? The answer is you're not. Everyone can think they're going to be ready, but you never are. And there is something to be said about when, when we're training, uh, again, kind of what I teach is you have to be you have to learn to be comfortable in very un uncomfortable situations, um, which is not easy and sort of counterintuitive. 
Right. But it becomes easy the more you do it like a muscle. And I will tell you, and I constantly sing his praises, and I'm going to build a statue of him in my backyard, uh, Mr. Shannon Blow. That, no, seriously, like our friendship and mentorship and, and all of the things that we work together, you taught me to live in that space. And unfortunately, it's fucked me up so much. I don't know how to just be this cold-hearted bastard that I used to be able to be so easily. This is why we can have these conversations and go in and out of jokes to serious to everything else. And you guys do this for a living. It's not to make it sound like it's easier, but it isn't that, uh, as you were saying earlier, it's like, what kind of sicko would want to do that? No, it, it takes somebody who's dedicated and emotionally in tune with themselves. Like It takes an awareness that most people I don't think have. But also, like, it is a beautiful art form that uh, just in my own little way that I've seen that it is a muscle that you can kind of tone up. And, you know, uh, like anything else, if you stay on that bike, it's, it's easier and easier to ride. I think you learn to navigate it better. This doesn't necessarily make the weight easier. And I do have to say in terms of when you were saying, uh, you know, we see somebody, I forget, Matt, if you were saying we have somebody die and we have to go to the next patient and go to the next room yeah. and act like everything is perfectly normal. Yeah. I have to shout out to the nurses who do that. Oh, goodness, yes. I have to say that yep. they uniquely are are on the front end of that in our hospitals. They're the hands-on. They're the healers. My job is not to be that. My job is to enable them to be the best that they are in giving care, right? I'm there to support them as much as the patients. So that, that, that I think, just has to be said. Yeah. The existential dilemma of humanity is we are one with our mothers, literally one with our mothers. Our mother's cells are changed because of us. We are cut from them and we don't even know we're a separate being right away. The separateness of our consciousness is traumatic. And, and, and so as a human being, our, our sense of aloneness and separateness um, is uh, creates all sorts of uh, ways of behavior to mask it and hide it and all that sort of stuff. In the end, what entering into these spaces together allow a level of connection, of 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 belonging, of being with that is uniquely healing. It heals in a way the existential wound by being with people in a uh, emotionally honest way. Uh, in their grief because it is a shared experience for us all. Just like birth is and that separation anxiety, so is death, the ultimate uh, kind of a thing. And so there is a, uh, a deep, deep connection. And, and so the worth of it really has uh, less to do with fixing people and more to do with how is it we connect more honestly? How do we belong even more honestly? Who's our tribe? hearing people and less about fixing and more about hearing people and seeing people and and sitting with them in their moment or whatever um you, you said you know yeah no there's not there's not leave for a best friend and there's not there's not leave for a dog um but people have apologized to me because they say well when my dog died i know it's not the same as mm. what you're going through it it's okay because you have experienced a loss you are human and you have experienced a loss yes. that affected you mm -hmm. It, it, suffering's not a contest. Grief isn't a contest to see who can cry harder or faster or more. Or it, yes. It's okay to. That's right. And somebody who embodies that is is you because I called her and I was like, hey, I wanted to say hi. I'm sorry I haven't reached out yet. And uh, I was like, do you want to go see a movie or something and hang out? And of course I asked how she was doing. But within that conversation, she started asking me questions about how I was doing. Uh, oh, you know what? How about this? I will use a quote you might know. Oh, maybe, maybe. So we went and saw the new Guardians of the Galaxy movie, the third one. In the first one, at the very end, <laughs> yeah. no, I'm not going to give any spoilers. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. At, the first, <laughs> at the first one, at the very end, <laughs> Star-Lord grabs the power stone and it's too much for him to handle. But what happens, the rest of the team link up Mm -hmm. And it's only by their shared and, and, and their different sizes and all these things, but they were able to contain something that was so devastating and so powerful by being there with each other. Yeah. And there is no nerdier thing to even use as an illusion, but 
since we saw that movie together. I thought yeah. I'd use and, it. And Rachel, I have and to. And I do too. I got to call you out too, though, because even in the brief moment we met sure. uh, before here, you, you were comparing how you were with the deaths of Tom and the deaths of your your um, your grandmother. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said, "Oh, but it's my grandmother. She's ninety eight. She was." We didn't quite say it that. Way. She was <laughs> you know, well, not quite that way, but still <laughs> yeah. there was a difference. But there, and, and right. grief is still grief. Grief and, is absolutely and, grief. And I think the important part of that is giving yourself the grace to grieve in the way that you need to and, and, and not minimizing it, whether it is your grandmother, your husband, your dog, your dog, anything else. Grief is grief. And, you know, we yeah. we yeah. saw it coming. Her health had been declining. Um, and the grief that we that I feel for her passing is more for us and not for her. You know, it's I'm I'm actually pretty relieved for her because yeah. my grandpa had been gone for more than a decade and <laughs> and she lost a child in infancy and like she had she's she now gets to be reunited. This is my Catholic faith speaking yeah. up here. She gets to be reunited with all the people that she has loved and lost. And so I'm relieved for her, but I'm just kinda like, Man. Oh, just Yeah. Ugh. So for Tom, am I hearing you say that he loved life? Loved it. Right? And so for him, you're grieving, of course, yourself, but you're also grieving that which he did not get to experience. You know? And that that we didn't get to experience together because we that's that's the biggest part of it. That's where that's where I feel grief for myself. Um, we have only been married five years. Goodness. Not long enough. Um, I mean, what's long enough, right? Never. But um, one of the things that I do love, yes, he absolutely did, and I can't think of a single person who has a single bad thing to say about him, and that's that gives me joy, and that's those are the things that help me on the hard days. Yeah, yeah. I want to thank everybody. I I I feel we're talking about the guilt about <laughs> grieving. I feel guilty wanting to end this conversation. Um, so. We're going to keep going for four more hours. Now, I I appreciate everybody's time today. And I'm going to ask each of you one short question as a wrap up. Uh, I'll start with you, Shannon. Shannon, what would you like on your tombstone? Hmm. He loved well. Beautiful. Rachel, you brought it up and you tease it and you never answered it. What is Tom's favorite color? <laughs> Blue. <laughs> It, it's he's a got good a good taste, yeah. Yeah. Portia, when this episode comes out and, and Molly is watching it up in heaven, what is her review going to be of what you did? I don't know. I don't know. She's going to say, you didn't make enough jokes. I'm, I'm not used to, like, I don't know. She probably would make fun of the lint that was on my boob for the, exactly. <laughs> for the, for the last 30 minutes. It reminds me of Goodwill Hunting. Like one of the most beautiful scenes is when Robin Williams is talking about his wife and how she would fart in bed. <laughs> and that was the beautiful memory. She would make fun of me for crying. <laughs> she would call me a punk. She'd be yeah. like, where are you crying, punk? <laughs> Molly, I think she's spot on. Yeah. Um, and Luke, thank you so much for joining this. I, I hope we can have you back on at some point. Sure. But uh, depends on the question. Oh, this is, that's good. Okay, now he's putting pressure on me. Yeah, I got to. What do you hope? Like all of us hope we can leave this amazing imprint on society. What do you want your final words to be? What do I want my final words to be? Yeah, you're gonna as soon as you say them, we're gonna take you out. <laughs> God, see when you say that, I, all I all I can think of is like two different movies. One is Captain Kirk going, oh my. <laughs> and the other is Doc Holliday, played by the fabulous Val Kilmer, who looks at his shoes and goes, well, ain't that a thing? Yeah. Because he was like, I'm going to die with my boots on, and he didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Captain Kirk, that was Star Wars? Yeah. Oh. You're not that I'm bad. I'm not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> with my luck, it's going to be, oh, shit, that wasn't chocolate, <laughs> or something like that, and then I'm dead. I want to screw with someone and be like, I have a secret, and it's buried. <laughs> huh? And then that'd be it. And then I want Matt to text everyone after my funeral and say, thanks for coming from That's my phone. That's brilliant. <laughs> it's so good. That is very fictional so because good. I will not be outliving you. I plan on living fast and hard from now on. These guys have taught me, if anything, you need to value life knowing what's coming. So I'm going to speed at it like 100 miles an hour. 
Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for sharing. This has been one, the definitely the most emotional episode we've ever done. And it, it truly takes bravery to do it and not in a way where it's like, look at me. Like, you guys are two of the strongest fucking people I've ever met. And so please understand how much the rest of us all here in this room appreciate that. Embrace the impermanence. And I'm going to go look for a living will when I get home. And none of you are in my regular will. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Follow me, I will show you. Life is short for all chronology. Let me in, I will break the complexity. Figured out instead of serendipity, serendipity. We just went there. Now you can go to the goingtherepodcast.com for links to all the podcast platforms, our socials, and of course, YouTube. While you're at it, give us a rating, share with a friend, and subscribe. Just like grief spans the emotions from sadness to joy, so do the songs of Liz Chidester and Liz and the Lovelies at lizandthelovelies.com, and you can find them on Bandcamp, YouTube, and all the streamers. This podcast is made possible by its hosts and Frame One Media in association with Joe Cowley and Bobby Thomas. My eyes.